G'day guys, it's Ben again, here to bring you another video, and this one is going to be looking at a variety of different medieval arrowheads. Uh, already the first ones we're going to talk about are tanged warheads from the Dark Ages. What you can see here is a tang. Right, you um, on, on all three of these warheads. There's nothing whatsoever to say that these would have been um, Viking or Saxon or Norman or whoever. Um, this was simply the style of arrowhead at that particular time and it would depend on the archer as to what they particularly preferred to use whether it was um, a tanged warhead like this or a, um, a socketed warheads like we'll go into in a few seconds time. Socketed warheads absolutely did exist and um, we know that by looking at uh, surviving uh, spearheads and so on uh, and some of the arrowheads as well but but these are all um, socketed warheads. Now what would have happened is this would have been held in place with a very small piece of rawhide. Right here. So this section here is the tang and this section is the warhead. This would then go into a small hole in the arrow shaft and would then essentially be held in place with a small piece of rawhide, uh, possibly some white glue or something like that, or cheese glue rather, and, and that would be that would be your lot. Um, now, uh, and these obviously are made from uh, so medieval iron. The next two we're going to talk about here are uh, caged arrowheads. Now we know these did exist, um, and these are obviously portrayed in Hollywood movies and on the screen all the time uh, in, in massive dramatic fire for effect type uh, sequences during Hollywood blockbuster movies. And that's simply not possible. The best way that I could visualize this working would be if, um, so something like if a rag was placed inside the cage soaked in something like pig fat or oil or um, linseed oil or, or something like that which would then create um, a, enough heat to sustain the flight. So what would happen in something like this is as this is released from the bow so the effect was, is, is going to be um, and I, I can imagine this working with something like um, uh, a piece of rag with some linseed oil or some um, uh, potentially potentially something like uh, pig fat or um, maybe even something like Greek fire if, if they had access to it. Um, however, um, this would probably be extinguished in flight uh, simply due to, to the, the action of the air around it uh, because it's not going to sustain a flame as such. Um, not in the way that we understand it. Um, however, I do believe it's possible, and I am going to do some testing on this uh, to see how this, this, this may work in, um, in real life. But um, the reality is that um, for every one that's, that actually managed to make it on target with, with enough heat left in to set itself alight, the reality, I believe, would be that, that most of them would, would uh, simply be extinguished. So um, I don't think this is something that many archers would carry around with them. Um, I, I just can't see it. Uh, and I, I just think it's sort of Hollywood sort of, um, you know, blockbuster drama, that kind of thing, and not really um, allowing the truth to come out. Now, this is an interesting arrowhead. Um, so all of my arrowheads, by the way, are reproductions. I don't yet own any actual genuine historical examples. I really, really would like to get ho get hold of some, but uh, but that's um, going to be an interesting one. Okay, so so this particular arrowhead, um, there's a lot of thought about it by various historians around the world, um, and as I understand it. Uh, some people seem to think that these could be used on, on rope or rigging on ships, which is, is really not possible. Um, and a, a bow is really an area weapon. So armies would attack in large formations, um, particularly during the higher Mid Middle Ages. And when we say large formations, we're talking tens of thousands of soldiers. So it doesn't, accuracy in, in the way that we might imagine, 
you know, Robin Hood style is, is just not a thing. It's not necessary because if I don't hit one guy, I'm going to hit the bloke next to him. And if not him, then it'll be the bloke next to him. So, um, you know, an archery was, was a very devastating kind of weapon. Radio. The artworks th that do exist and have survived the medieval period portray this as being a hunting arrowhead. And I, I believe that this would be quite effective against um, small, small quarry such as hare, rabbit, quail, uh, pheasant uh, and deer. Uh, and the reason is that um, part of the arrowhead may strike causing a longer incision followed by uh, this second point uh, coming around and, and gouging into the skin enough that this would then um, leave enough of a blood trail for the dogs to follow and that's how we've developed many uh, of, of the dog species that we know and love today uh, as, as, as hunting dogs. Um, so this is a legitimate um, medieval arrowhead and, and used for hunting. Chippin and broadheads. Uh, so these um, these are very common. Um, I've, I've got quite a few of these. I use these quite a lot. Uh, I like these. These are good arrowheads um, and and very effective. Uh, so what I like, like what I like about these is, is is if this does go into the target, it's not actually that hard to remove it. Um, and it just simply takes a little bit of working to get it out of, of a target if it does get stuck in. Um, but there we go. It's very simple, uh, very easy to produce. Um, not that expensive, certainly not compared to some of the other ones. And, um, but still, still a devastatingly effective arrowhead. The next series of arrowheads we have here are the Swallowtails. Okay. Um, this particular one is largely portrayed as being a horse killer. Um, you know, I struggle to really accept that. Uh, I, I don't dispute that this could kill a horse at... Um, now, there's been scientific testing done in the UK and actually some other countries as well, and they found that um, in order to really be taking on um, uh, a knight charging towards you, you'd be wanting to hit the knight at around about the 20 to 30 meter range. And the English archers and English and Welsh archers of the day protected themselves with a large log that was dug into the ground and sharpened at the other end. Therefore, what would happen is that horse charging towards you, and remember a horse, a medieval war horse, easily could weigh plus 600 kilograms, half a metric ton. Um, and if that horse doesn't, you know, kill you by, um, sorry, if you're not killed by the knight, you're most likely to be killed by the horse trampling over you. So, um, knights in formation, which would be riding shoulder to shoulder, um, if, if they don't visualize the target, um, and then they're simply going to impale their horse onto this, um, this great big stake. So, look, this, um, I'm, I'm saying more myth than anything. I don't believe it, I'm not suggesting it didn't exist, but um, it's, it's quite a weighty arrowhead. Uh, as I say, this is a production, but, um, sorry, that's, that's a reproduction arrowhead, but if you think that an archer is just simply going to be, you know, um, smacking out, an, an English or Welsh archer could, could fire easily, um, you know, 12 to 20 arrows accurately per minute. So in the air at any one time, you could find three or four arrows from each archer. And if you're talking about having 2,000 archers, that means you have, you know, you're talking six to 8,000 arrows in the air at any one time during something like the Battle of Ashencourt or Battle of Cressé. So what we have is, would I, as an, as an archer, suddenly pull my arrowheads off and start putting these on when a horse is getting close to me? No. Um, and, and I'm simply going to keep firing and, uh, and take my shelter, you know, take shelter behind the, um, the log. 
So I, I tend to dispute whether that's real as an arrowhead or, or certainly would have been used with any any uh, frequency. Um, this particular swallowtail uh, is, uh, again, I, I tend to dispute this one um, simply because the flare is, is not particularly wide and the um, it hasn't come uh, it, it, it seems to go back a long way again a fairly wasted arrow head and what that's going to cause the arrow to do mid-flight is it's going to go off the target so I, I really do struggle to think that this is as historically accurate as I might like to think it is um, but these were portrayed as being um, being man killers and once the arrow was inside you it would be then almost impossible to remove the arrow because of, of these um, barbs and I, I, I also dispute that because um, it's not hard to figure out how to remove a, such a barbed arrowhead and I'll talk about that in a future video so I really do tend to dispute these this particular one however um, there's lots of examples of these all around um, you know Western Europe so throughout the UK what is now Germany modern-day France modern-day Belgium modern-day you know Norway and, and Denmark all of these sorts of countries modern-day Italy you can find these around about the battlefields this is a man killer this is a very legitimate um, uh, I believe it's a type 15 um, under the, the typologies but I, I'm, I'm not super uh, uh, an expert with those but um, what you do have here is a very very devastating uh, arrowhead simple lightweight um, very much a um, an effective weapon to use um, and we'll talk about uh, arrow wounds in a future video as well Ugh. but for those of you who are wondering what a genuine sort of 12th, 13th, 14th century arrowhead looked like, this is it. Um, and, and this would have been absolutely devastating against larger game such as deer, um, the predators such as wolf, bear, uh, even sort of um, European lynx or European tiger. Very sorry there, I'm not entirely sure what happened with my camera. The sound was recording but for some strange reason the, the actual picture seemed to have uh, paused. Okay, right, the next three arrowheads we have here are all called bodkins. Okay, now um, this is a rounded bodkin, it's approximately 75 millimeters or 3 inches long. Uh, again, historical reproduction. These are great at being able to punch through um, plate armor and fabric and fabric armor which um, fabric armor obviously was the, by far the most common gambesons and various different types of gambesons call them what you like akatons coat armor um, jackets and so on um, they're, they're all a similar kind of purpose and, and a round bodkin like that would punch through them very easily what a round bodkin um, couldn't do or didn't do very well was punching through chainmail. Chainmail obviously is a very um, predominant type of armor right throughout um, the whole kind of uh, period from from the Roman period right through till still in use in 1600 or so. So um, uh, chainmail was an extraordinarily effective armor um, against so many different things. Um, but but what they did is they changed the bodkins and they created a square pattern on it and the reason that they did this is because as the force um, a, a round object into a round hole is simply going to stop like a cork in a wine bottle however a square object into a round hole is going to project the force onto those four edges and that circle will break and what this could do is at a relatively close range let's say 20 to 50 meters um, if not longer in some cases these bodkin arrows would go straight through chainmail uh, and right into the the gambeson so 
at that stage, and, and what we're talking about here is the um, into the 10th century, right through definitely the 11th century, you started to see heavier bows being used. Now, unfortunately, we have no way of knowing by a heavy bow what exactly a heavy bow meant. Um, because they had no way of being able to measure um, the the amount of energy required to draw the bow back to full length. Obviously we do today, it's called a pair of scales. Um, but it couldn't be done in medieval times and certainly not a, the same kind of way. And so um, an archer would simply have bows made and there were many very good archers um, whether or not you choose to believe in historical people um, uh, and the, some of the historical characters those historical characters such as Robin Hood and so on were obviously based on actual genuine real people and um, uh, I, I, I certainly think that um, those kind of people who became very famous for their archery skills and talents, particularly post-Norman conquest. Um, you see here people like um, Herald the Wake and so on, uh, very much a real person um, and very much, I believe, um, a, a credible basis for some of the Robin Hood tales. I certainly think some of the Robin Hood tales were based on Robert Hood, and I certainly think that there's a, there's a number of other people whom um, that's based on. We'll get into that perhaps in another video, but that's probably uh, a good year or so away because I'd like to really go into some of the actual country where that was filmed and bring you some of those kind of things, but um, which at the moment I can't really do from, from Queensland, Australia. Okay, moving swiftly along. I just bought this just recently and uh, this is obviously another square bodkin. Uh, I didn't realise it was going to come polished, which is um, a, a bit disappointing for me because everything else is is not. Um, although what this does is it, it shows quite clearly um, the the changes in the length. So in the higher Middle Ages, now talking 13th, 14th centuries, this is the kind of long bodkin that was being used because gambesons were very thick. Um, chain mail was being used in conjunction with things like um, coat of plates and um, some of the plate armor was increasing in thickness uh, around some of the vulnerable and critical areas so um, you have this kind of sort of cold war kind of developing clearly not so cold sometimes um, and especially with the lessons that were being brought back from the Crusades and um, the Battle of Visi and those kind of things um, correction Visby you, you see some of these developments and I think this was was sort of very interesting uh, and to see that combined with a bow that would have maybe weighed a, a fairly easy 120 130 pound um, that would have been an absolutely devastating weapon and go straight through someone um, irrespective of armor so uh, alrighty guys so we've got some some good videos in archery coming up um, we'll be doing flame arrows uh, at some point in the next couple of months, probably towards the later part of 2019, we'll be looking at uh, certainly doing some arrow tests around um, this sort of crescent type. I'd like to do some uh, some looks at the swallowtails and probably in early 2020 we'll be looking at some videos on bodkins versus armour. And of course uh, we'll be looking at something along the lines of the the flame arrows and looking at doing some testing on those see how that comes out uh, okay I really hope you enjoyed the video please like subscribe and share and I'll catch you in my next video